Hi everyone, my name is Matt Williams. I'm the Access Fellow here at Jesus College, the University of Oxford. I'm going to give you a brief history of the city and the university now. It's going to have to be very brief because the university is about 900 years old. There's some evidence of undergraduate education going back to 1096, making it not quite the oldest university in continuous operation in the world. That title is held by the University of Bologna in Northern Italy, but it is the oldest university in the English speaking world. So old in fact that it's been educating undergraduates since before the time there were even human beings on the islands of New Zealand. So before the Maori set foot on New Zealand, Oxford University has been partaking in university education. And some things of course have transformed over that 900 years, but some aspects are actually quite similar to the founding. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to romp my way through this long, complicated history. I'm not going to be ducking some of the difficult matters, some of the maybe more embarrassing stories, but hopefully it'll give you a bit of a better sense of what our present at the university is and what our future may entail. Okay, so an important place to start, I guess, is to move away from Jesus College and actually go back to the earliest founding college, uh, which is usually credited, although there's some dispute, uh, to this college, which is University College. Now, first question might be, why are there even colleges? Why is the University of Oxford split into 39 colleges and six what are known as private halls? Well, the colleges are a little bit like states of the Un United States of America. They are semi-autonomous entities. Autonomous in the sense that they govern themselves, they make their own policies, they admit their own students. But they're also under the rubric of the University of Oxford and the university is the one that administers the degrees and and organizes exams and lectures and all the rest of it. So this is a relationship a little bit like between the federal government of the US and the independent states that comprise it. And similar to the US, through time, little communities have been tacked on to the larger entity. So just as the states of Hawaii and Alaska joined the United States of America in the mid 20th century, so colleges have been joining the University of Oxford through time. And the oldest, dates back to the 1200s, and that's this one, University College. So there was teaching prior to that, typically done in smaller halls. Colleges emerged in about the 13th century. The most recent college, which I'll talk about a little bit later, was actually founded in 2020. So colleges are being added all the time. Anyway, so let's have a, have a look inside uh, you know, uh, so that you can have a, have a look. Now, why was Oxford founded? Why, where does it even come from? Well, as with lots of things in medieval English history, part of the origin story is to do with a war with France. In those days, the kings of England claimed dominion over parts of France, so they felt that they were kings of France as well as kings of England. And during one of the perennial spats between our continental neighbours, the English king, Henry II, got particularly fed up with France, and he forbade people from going to France, and therefore that meant that scholars wishing to attend the then most prestigious university in the continent, the University of Paris, were in incapable of doing so. And so they needed to find somewhere else to do their studies. Those were typically studies of theology, religion, and for about 700 or so years, that was the dominant function of the University of Oxford, was to train theologians and religious leaders. And so without somewhere to go in the continent, the scholars decided, well, we're not going to stick around in London because London is a bit dangerous and a bit dirty. So we'll go to a little city to the northwest of London, a bit cleaner, a little bit further out. It was called Oxford because it was a place on the River Thames where the oxen could ford the river. In other words, where cattle could be, could be easily transported across the river because it's quite a narrow sort of choke point in the River Thames, the same river that ends up in London. Uh, and so the scholars ended up there. So this was a city before it was a university. So there was already city folk, there was already at city walls, it was relatively well established. And this led to some tension between the city folk and the students who had various different sort of privileges. Indeed, the students were actually subject to different laws which really upset some of the townsfolk to the extent that there was occasionally running battles between the lot of them and uh, for some of the scholars this was just intolerable they couldn't take it and they ran off to found a new university where there were no city people and that became the University of Cambridge so Cambridge was founded by Oxford academics and students that basically got fed up of Oxford <laughs> and founded a university where there was no uh, no city um, now the development of the university from this initial foundation, from this sort of spat with France, from this sort of small cluster of scholars coming together, exploded as a result of plague, as a result of the Black Death. And this college, New College, has an important part to play in that particular story uh, because 
despite its name, it's not new by modern terms, but it was new at the time in the 1300s when it was founded. And there was a great need for new theological education because so many priests and vicars were dying as a result of administering the last rites and spreading the word of God to people who were dying of plague. And so there was a need to massively expand the university. So the Black Death, uh, sadly, has an important part to play in the story. And we know this is important for this particular college, New College, because you can see here the original city walls. So these are the, the best preserved uh, parts of the Oxford city walls that are actually in the grounds of New College. And if you tra trace them all the way along, you can see here next to the New College bell tower, there's a little pub. You might not quite be able to make it out, but there's a pub in, in the midst of these buildings here called the Turf Tavern. And the Turf Tavern is very, very old. It's a 13th, 14th century uh, hostelry. And the pub within the last decade tried to build uh, a little sort of permanent structure in its gardens to keep the rain off the customers' heads. And they dug down just a little way and they found quite a lot of human skull fragments. And basically what had happened after the archaeologists and the police had done some investigation, they worked out that it was bodies that were being chucked over the city walls during the plague. Um, so a bit grim, but you know, you can't sort of get away from these sorts of stories in medieval England. Uh, New College, perhaps more recently, is quite well known uh, for its starring role in various films. So you might recognise these cloisters from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Uh, it was also used for the Mamma Mia 2 film. Um, in fact, when they were filming Mamma Mia, uh, they played I Kiss the Teacher over and over to the extent that the students and fellows of the college got really fed up of ABBA. And I think ABBA is now probably banned from New College forever. Anyway, so that was the, the expansion of the university was in part precipitated by, by plague. Now, one thing that I've already mentioned is that a key early theme of the University of Oxford was religious education. And indeed, a, a lot of the colleges retain a religious name in, in recognition of that past. So this is Magdalen College. Magdalen is the old English way of pronouncing Magdalene, as in Mary Magdalene. Uh, and this college uh, epitomizes some of the early uh, ideals of the university, which is to do with Christian education and charitable education. Although Magdalen College is, is magnificently grand and looks like a, a very, very well-heeled boarding school for extremely privileged people, in line with the Christian ethic, it has always, always been intent on educating all people, regardless of rank. And in, in line with the, with the principles of Christian charity, and that's still important to us today. I think it's often associated, uh, thought that Oxford is this place where people who have had uh, extremely privileged lives will go to finish their education. And certainly that has always been true, but it has always, also always been true that, the, that those from the poorest backgrounds have also been readily admitted to the university because that was considered to be essential to obtain the Christian mission of education. These days, the the university and its colleges are secular, so they don't have a specific religious mission anymore, but they still retain that ethic that education is something that anyone can aspire to. It doesn't matter whether or not you're the, the son or daughter of a prince or the son or daughter of a pauper, you still have the same basic hardware, the same neural capabilities, and you therefore have just as much a right as anyone else. So although it can be difficult to imagine, these buildings are genuinely here for everyone and always have been. So this notion that Oxford is, is socially exclusive, I'm afraid has never been the case and is certainly not the case today. So even though Magdalen College, as grand as it, as it is, and it's got a deer park in its gardens, for goodness sake, which is perhaps a little bit sort of excessive in these massive fields, they've got deer that roam around. Um, it's genuinely there for, for anyone provided they are willing to work hard, study hard, and do the best that they can to spread knowledge, because that's ultimately what the university is all about. Anyway, uh, leaping forward in time a little bit, we need to get to the Enlightenment. So the, the dawn of science in, um, in Europe is coincident with a particular development, which is the importation of coffee. Now, there's some lively debate as to whether or not coffee, in fact, caused the Enlightenment. In other words, the, the, uh, the spread of scientific learning and knowledge in, uh, to replace religious dogma. It does seem remarkably coincident that when people started 
moving away from drinking beer most of the time in order to hydrate themselves to drinking coffee, that suddenly there was this big leap in productivity uh, and work uh, in the sciences. And the reason I'm showing you this little building on the corner is because it claims to be the oldest coffee shop in England and was therefore an important hangout for academics in the early 17th century. And science became a hugely important part of the university's story, of course. And if we, if we shift over just to the north of the city, this is Wadham College. Wadham College was founded in 1610. And in the fairly large gardens that you can see here next to the college, there were scientific experiments that went on uh, in the early 17th century, just before the Civil War. And they were conducted by academics and students. And this became the Royal Society. So what we now know is the Royal Society and the Journal and the Fellows of the Royal Society, which is the preeminent scientific body of the United Kingdom, began in these gardens here. And some of its earliest members include Sir Christopher Wren, who was an undergraduate student here at Wadham, and he uh, would come and do these experiments with people like Robert Hooke of Hooke's Law. Robert Hooke was an academic based at Christchurch College, and Hooke, uh, perhaps one of his uh, lesser known uh, claims to fame is that he he rejected Isaac Newton's first paper for publication. Uh, Isaac Newton was a Cambridge academic. Hooke uh, was based in Oxford and Hooke rejected his paper. Newton was so crushed by this rejection that he didn't even attempt to publish something for another 20 years. And as I understand it, the next thing he published was his Principia Mathematica. So he's a man who sort of, you know, knew how to kick back at his, uh, <laughs> at his uh, critics. But anyway, so the, the, um, the scientific um, enlightenment really uh, kicked off here in Oxford. And these days you can see all of the science buildings are just north of Wadham. So this is where the science departments are all located uh, and they're sort of clustered around here. Uh, and Oxford uh, has, I mean, it's quite difficult to measure the scientific output of a university, but one fairly clumsy measure, but nonetheless a measure, is uh, the number of Nobel Prize winners. And the University of Oxford has no, more Nobel Prize winners in science uh, than France and Belgium combined. So it's a real sort of quite heavyweight when it comes to the sciences, and it's still working in this regard. So I mentioned that the most recent college was founded this year in 2020. And that's this college on the corner. So they've, they've repurposed some of the old uh, Radcliffe Science buildings. So these are called the Radcliffe Science Library. And they've made this into a new co college. It's called Rubin College, founded in 2020. It's going to be focused for postgraduate research into climate change uh, and um, artificial intelligence in particular. So it's really at the cutting edge of sciences, which you'd uh, expect from, from Oxford. Okay, so... What about uh, some of the more recent developments with regards to the recognition of minority rights? Now, actually, when we start, we should start by talking about women, and women, of course, are not minorities. So how did Oxford finally come to recognize women? Well, it's embarrassingly late in the day, and there's really no getting away from the fact that it's one of the stupidest things I can, I can even think of. From a city that claims to be so intelligent to not admit women, for hundreds and hundreds of years is completely indefensible. These days, we actually admit more women than men as undergraduates. So women are coming through uh, and will soon be uh, the majority, which in numerical terms makes sense because women are a majority in society. But anyway, for a long time, there was, a, there was just a plain uh, misogyny that uh, barred women from education. Uh, and that started to change in the 19th century when this college, Lady Margaret Hall, was founded solely for the education of women. These days, Lady Margaret Hall, or LMH as it's usually shortened to, is mixed. All of the colleges are now mixed. There used to be a few colleges that were for women only and a few for men only, but now they're all mixed. The first male-only college to admit women was Jesus College, in fact, and it was led by our principal, uh, Sir John Habakkuk, who also encouraged four other colleges at the same time in 1974 to admit women. But 1974 is still magnificently late in the day. Anyway, Lady Margaret Hall started educating women in the 19th century. They were only allowed to take degrees at the University of Oxford from 1922 onwards, so still less than 100 years, which is truly shocking. But uh, to an extent, the university has been trying to make up for lost time. It can never do so properly, but you know, we, can, we can always hope. And one of the most important developments with regards to the rights of women uh, was established here at Somerville College. Now, Somerville was another women's only college, and one of their most notable alumna uh, is um, Dorothy Hodgkin. Now she was a chemist, chemistry fellow here, 
uh, fellow just means tutor. And she taught here um, uh, before the Second World War and during it. And her great contribution to science was working out the chemical structure of penicillin, of vitamin B12, and of insulin. And she did so by using a painstaking technique called X-ray crystallography, whereby X-rays are put through a crystal of penicillin, for example. And the way the light, the, well, the way the X-rays bounce out of the crystal can give you a sense of the internal molecular structure of that of that molecule and so she did all of the mathematics to work out how penicillin was actually put together there were various theories as to what penicillin was from a chemical basis but it wasn't confirmed until Hodgkin did the painstaking work during the second world war now the reason that that is significant for the rights of women is that once it was known what penicillin was made of so of course it was understood that penicillin was a mold but how you could actually recreate it and synthesize it and mass produce it wasn't known until Hodgkin did her work. And so once she'd worked that out, then right next door, uh, what used to be the Radcliffe uh, Infirmary, uh, which is this sort of former hospital on the corner is now part of the Humanities Institute. Uh, it was possible to mass produce a chemical synthesis of penicillin. And that has transformed the world. So people used to die quite often of infections, which these days we would treat quite readily with, with antibiotics. And one of the most easily procured and mass produced antibiotics has been, of course, penicillin. And this transformed the role of women because in, uh, one of its effects was to improve maternal health and improve infant health and lower infant mortality. So all of a sudden, you didn't necessarily need to have eight, nine children in order to ensure that some would make it to maturity, you could have a smaller number of children with greater confidence that they would survive. And it's the nexus of these two buildings, Somerville College and the neighboring uh, Radcliffe in Infirmary that produced that change. And its effects are global in scale. And honestly, I think these two buildings are, are perhaps amongst the most important in the entirety of, of, the, of England. I, I really cannot get over how important these buildings are. Um, also, in terms of women's rights, although perhaps a bit more of a, a mixed picture uh, with regard to Somerville College, is that one of the chemistry undergraduates that came to study here with Dorothy Hodgkin uh, was a lady called Margaret Roberts, who is better known to history as Margaret Thatcher. She's the only science uh, graduate of the university uh, that went on to become prime minister. Um, but nonetheless, uh, that's where she studied chemistry. And her first job was in making ice creams. <laughs> so perhaps not uh, widely known about the Iron Lady, but she helped to produce ice creams. Um, so what about true minorities? So women are not a, a numerical minority, but have been underrepresented at Oxford for many years until today. What about people of colour? Well, the story there, again, is, is embarrassing, and we're working to rectify it. These days, the undergraduates, we admit, 22% are BAME, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic. Um, that still within that 22%, the representation of specific uh, groups is, is mixed. So for example, black British students are still underrepresented uh, and therefore more work needs to be done about that. And the university has had a difficult uh, time in recognizing some of, its, uh, some of its role in say the transatlantic slave trade and other imperial ventures, which of course has, have affected the, uh, the rights of black people and people of color throughout the world. Now this college, for example, this is All Souls College. All Souls College is, a, is an unusual college in that it's for fellows only, so it's only for tutors. And this is the, its library over here. This is called the Codrington Library. And Codrington was a man who made his fortune from transatlantic slavery. And so the college uh, and the university have been taking steps to try and make it absolutely clear that the past practices of these individuals is utterly reprehensible. That doesn't necessarily resolve the historic injustices that took place, but at least there's some, finally some consciousness of its, of its uh, significance. Uh, perhaps more widely known is the Roads Must Fall campaign. Uh, oh, no, just jumped into a shop by accident. Uh, Roads Must Fall re refers to a statue of Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes was a, an imperial adventurer uh, and a diamond merchant who made a, a fortune creating the De Beers Diamond Company. And here he is uh, on a pedestal in the middle of the high street. And that's the problem. 
is that he's literally on a pedestal and yet he's a man who stole land uh, and exploited um, black Africans in a way that wasn't literally legal servitude, uh, sorry, slavery, but was in many cases tantamount to it uh, and was just uh, utterly reprehensible by, by modern moral standards. And so finally, the college has decided to take down the statue after after months of pressure from from people uh, around the world and also from its own students and from other students around the university because it's understandably uncomfortable to walk down a high street and see a man celebrated who was who was so overtly racist so you know that the history of the university is not all pretty and we are finally taking steps to address that i'd say that we could probably go further and faster but at least some acknowledgement is beginning to take place. Okay, what about sort of power more generally? So the University of Oxford is associated with a number of things, and one of them is, is producing politicians. So if we go up here to St. John's College, for example, uh, this has produced prime ministers of Thailand, of Sudan, <coughs> and indeed of the United Kingdom in the form of Tony Blair. Um, and in fact, half of all prime ministers that have ruled uh, the UK have been students at Oxford University. So of the 56 prime ministers that we've had in this country, 28 of them were students at Oxford, four of whom were students here at Balliol uh, College. And they have an interesting story to tell with regards to Brexit. So the first of the Balliol prime ministers was a man called H.H. H. Asquith. He was the prime minister in the First World War. Uh, and during his government, continental Europe tore itself apart in one of the uh, first truly mechanized industrial wars uh, and its bloody consequences, which of course is a prelude to the creation of the European Union as a, as a measure to ensure the security of continental Europe. The second prime minister was Harold Macmillan. Harold Macmillan uh, was one of the soldiers in that war in the First World War, and he was the only young man to come back alive from the, the Western Front. So he'd gone from Balliol with his fellow student soldiers, well over a hundred of them, and he was the only one to come back alive, which is just an astonishing thing to consider. Can you imagine the psychological impact that would have on someone, on a young man, to know that all of his friends had died except for himself? And when he became prime minister, he had an almost messianic seal to join what was then known as the common market, and we now know as the European Union. This was back in the 1960s. And part of his ambition was because of the horrors of war he had seen firsthand and his desire to obtain security. The third prime minister to have come out of Balliol, uh, was uh, Edward Heath. And he was similarly interested in promoting peace. He had been, uh, as an undergraduate, active in the Oxford Union, which is a debating society. And he traveled to Germany and he'd met Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler uh, and seen Adolf Hitler speak at the Nuremberg rally before the Second World War started. And he was so appalled at what he'd seen that he committed the Oxford Union to ending appeasement and he then spent the rest of his adult life fighting for the security of Europe and he was the, the prime minister who was finally successful in obtaining Britain's membership of the common market uh, what we now call the European Union on New Year's Day 1st of January 1973 and then the fourth prime minister to have come out of Balliol College was the current one Boris Johnson who of course is in many uh, cases credited or blamed, depending on your perspective, for hoiking Britain out of the European Union. So two of the men that basically got us in uh, and the one man that got us out all attended the same college just here on the corner of Broad Street. It's quite bizarre uh, history, but power is an important part of the story of Oxford. Uh, another sort of college to be considered in that narrative is Christchurch. Christchurch is let me just find it where have we gone Ooh, lost myself lost my bearings here we go so christchurch is down here uh, of the 28 oxford prime ministers 13 of them were educated at this college alone meaning that this college has produced more prime ministers than any educational uh, institute uh, in the uk uh, and there's an interesting story with regards to this statue this is a statue of mercury and this has been stolen from its plinth four times in the college's history. 
And the story goes that <clears throat> three of the four people that stole Mercury became prime minister. So it's almost like sword in the stone. If you can sort of steal Mercury, you might become the prime minister of, of Britain. <laughs> I don't think it has a sort of quite clear causal connection, but anyway. Um, the key thing to note, of course, is that you don't need to have those ambitions today if you want to become an Oxford student. We're not looking for people who are going to become the next uh, prime minister, president, etc. We're looking for people that want to work hard and study hard and are interested in the universe and the world around them. So, for example, at this college, Merton College, uh, one of their former students is now uh, Emperor Naruhito of of Japan. Um, so you might sort of think, crikey, well, I'm not going to become Emperor of Japan, so how on earth could I be admitted to the university? But remember what I said earlier, right? University is and always has been for everyone. In fact, that's why we, we insist on people wearing academic dress. So students, when they go for exams, exams take place here in what's known as exam schools, they have to wear a gown and what's known as sub-fusk, which, uh, which is a sort of uh, modest clothing. Um, and they do so because they, the university wants to make sure that everyone looks and feels equal in the eyes of the university, because as far as the university is concerned, they are equal. Everyone is equally ignorant of the complexities of the universe, and we're all groping our way to some sort of truth. And just because someone's got huge amounts of power and money doesn't make them any more sort of capable of discerning reality. So that's uh, an important thing to bear in mind. If your ambition in the future is to become a full-time carer for a loved one, good for you. That's great. That, we, we're not concerned with, with what you intend to do with your life. All we're concerned about is what you intend to do while you're at the university. Okay, so please don't sort of think, oh, crikey, I, I can only apply if I'm planning on becoming the next leader of the world. Not at all. So what about culture and recreation? Well, um, perhaps one of the most uh, well-known aspects of the university's recreational uh, interests is rowing and rowing takes place here these are this is called boathouse island so you can't quite discern it here but this is a little island and each of these are boathouses for the colleges this huge one on this side of the river is for university college they got given a huge grant by some rich alumnus who, who gave them money and this is the river thames so if you row far enough down here you'll end up in london um, and what the what the colleges do is that in preparing for competitions against universities like cambridge they row along here against each other. So all of the colleges have their own uh, boat clubs and they do what's known as bumps racing. So bumps racing is rather than rowing side by side as you would probably have seen in most rowing competitions, you row in a single file line and the idea is that you're supposed to try and bump into the boat in front of you before you get bumped by the one behind. There's a line of 13 of these boats that try to smack into each other and it's it does sound quite dangerous, but it's a lot of fun. And it's been going on for about 200 years. So you can go all the way back and see the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows of this competition going way back into the past. So that's one of the things that uh, Oxford is perhaps best renowned for. And the Oxford colours, the dark blue of Oxford, uh, comes from uh, the dark blue of Christchurch College. Uh, and one of the students there basically determined that the whole university's colours would, would be the colours of his college. Anyway, uh, right next to the river is this, the Ifley Sports Ground. And this also has another sort of famous part of the university's history, which is that this was the first place that the four minute mile was broken. Uh, one of the academics of the university, Sir Roger Bannister, he wasn't Sir Roger then, he is now, he hypothesized that it was possible for a human being to run faster, to run a mile in less than four minutes. This had previously been thought to be impossible, uh, that it was just beyond our physiological capabilities. But Bannister not only came up with the theory and the hypothesis that it was possible, he then, like a good scientist should, proved it himself by running it right here um, and breaking the four minute mile. Uh, and apart from, um, uh, apart from sport, the university has also been prominent as regards uh, um, drama, uh, literature, music, and all sorts of other things. So with regards to literature, you can go back to Christchurch, where uh, all sorts of important uh, authors and poets were students. Uh, Lewis Carroll, for example, of Anson Wonderland fame, W.H. Uh, Auden as well, the, the poet. If you head over to Merton, you can see the tree that inspired uh, J.R.R. Tolkien to write about the Ents in The Lord of the Rings because he was a fellow here at Merton College. 
Uh, Iris Murdoch was, uh, was a student up at Somerville College up to the north of the university. So literature is important. Uh, acting and drama is important. So here at uh, Queen's College is where uh, Mr. Bean was a student, Rowan Atkinson. And he took part in a comedy troupe along with Richard Curtis, the man who wrote and directed Four Weddings and the Funeral. Back at New College is where Kate Beckinsale was a student. And just uh, up and across the street is Wadham College, where Rosamund Pike and Felicity Jones were students. So Oxford isn't just a place where, as is often uncharitably said, fun goes to die. Uh, Oxford is also a place where people play hard and also produce skills other than academic skills, such as acting, uh, music, uh, direction, and so on. Okay, so what about the future? Well, I've already mentioned that Rubin College is, has been founded and is gonna be looking at artificial intelligence and climate change. We've also got this exciting development that is taking place here. So you can see a big patch of just empty space. Uh, and this is going to become what's known as the Radcliffe Observatory Quarter. So that you can see the Radcliffe Observatory is here. And this space here will be filled fairly soon with a building called the Schwartzman Center uh, for the uh, study of the ethics of artificial intelligence. So it's going to become a huge part of the humanities infrastructure of the university. It will um, be having a, an investment of £150 million, so a huge investment into the development of AI, ethics and philosophy, which is going to be absolutely fundamental. And it's being surrounded by some other important new additions to the university. This is the new Maths Institute here. And on the other side, this is the Blavatnik School of Government. And just across the road is a slightly older uh, part of the university. This is the Oxford University Press, where the famous Oxford English dictionaries are, are written and published. So, as I was trying to, to say, the university has a very long history. It's got some old buildings as a result, but it's always been at the cutting edge. So there's a slight ironic tension in the university, which is that people assume that because the university is so old, it must be somehow very conservative, it must be stuck in the past, it must be wedded to tradition and the past. And I can certainly understand how you could get that impression, but actually academics and students are always pushing the boundaries. So it's a remarkably vibrant, progressive place because that's how knowledge is, is, is produced, is by pushing against received wisdom and trying to come up with some new answers to long-standing problems. So this is not a university that's stuck in the past. It's had some indefensible uh, policies over the years, not least of which is the failure and refusal to educate women until, uh, until very recently, uh, the failure to recognize people of different uh, skin colors as equal to white people. Totally indefensible, completely stupid. For a university that's supposed to be intelligent, there's, there's just no other word for it than utter gopping idiocy for those sorts of uh, prejudiced policies. But these days, that's well behind us, uh, and we are taking steps to try and rectify some of the past uh, horrors that Oxford has been complicit in. Uh, there's still a lot to be done, but we're getting there. And the future for the university is bright. It's had 900 years so far, and it's developed uh, a great reputation around the world for producing knowledge and helping to make the lives of people better. And I think one of the most fantastic examples of that is penicillin. This is a concrete case where the University of Oxford has shaped people's lives and made them stronger and better. And we hope to continue to do so for another 900 plus years. And hopefully you can be a part of that story as well. So if you would like any more information, do by all means get in touch with me at matthew.williams at jesus.ox.ac.uk if I can help you work out more about the university and how you can maybe make a strong application, then I'd love to help you try. So thank you so much for watching. If you could give us a like and a share uh, and a subscribe, that would be amazing. Uh, and I hope to meet you all soon. Thank you so much. Goodbye.